Do girls fall behind in science and engineering because our society tells them they should be pretty rather than pretty brilliant? Whoa, hey, careful with that. Why don't you hand that to your brother? Well, that's the message of a new Verizon campaign, and the ad has gone viral. Isn't it time we told her she's pretty brilliant, too? Encourage her love of science and technology and inspire her to change the world. Now, a lot of journalists found the ad enthralling. Both NBC and ABC deemed it powerful. A Slate writer said it was a blast of refreshing, cool air. It brought tears to the eyes of a reporter at Ad Week. But so far, not one of these excited reporters thought to check the facts. Now, here are just a few examples of dubious information that concern the factual feminist. For example, confidence drops from 72% to 55% between middle school and high school. Well, what's the source? Verizon provides a list of references via a link called Dive Deeper Into Each of Our Stats. But the source cited for the confidence drop is an Internet infographic posted by someone associated with a website about online engineering degree programs. And what does this confidence gap really mean? I mean, does it refer to confidence in math and science or overall self-esteem? That is never explained and no source is offered. Why is Verizon relying on some random, poorly sourced internet graphic for its research? Let's continue. According to the ad, 66% of fourth grade girls reported that they like science and math, but by college, only 18% of all engineering majors are female. ABC deemed this fact startling. Well, startling, yes, but it's also deeply misleading. Engineering is an outlier. Today, girls earn 44% of college math degrees, 48% of chemistry degrees, and 61% of biology degrees. But why allow some inconvenient fact to get in the way of a powerful, short-changed girl narrative? I mean, suppose you said 66% of fourth grade girls like science and math, but by college only 61% of all biology majors are females. I mean, that doesn't quite do the trick. And what's the source for the 66% statistic? I don't doubt its truth, but Verizon cites a post from the feminist blog Jezebel. Now, the facts behind the Inspire Her Mind campaign are a complete mess, and the deeper you dive, the worse it gets. Now, you might think, even if the statistics are muddled, Maybe there's a truth in the spirit of the video, but that would be wrong. In one pivotal scene, Samantha's curiosity in marine biology is squelched by her father. Sam, honey, you don't want to mess with that. Let's put him down. Now, from this scene, you would never guess that girls today earn 64% of college degrees in marine biology. And in another segment, we see a slightly older Samantha appearing to study a poster announcing a science fair. However, she is using the display case as a mirror to put on her lip gloss. The message is clear. We are crushing our daughters by insisting they be pretty and ladylike. Well, again, there's a problem. Girls are thriving in science fairs. I mean, in many states, including Massachusetts and Connecticut, they now outnumber boys at these fairs. They are approaching parity with boys at the prestigious Intel Fair. And look what happened when Google launched its first ever science fair. The factual feminist applauds Verizon for encouraging more girls to pursue careers in math and science. I want that, too. But this ad is a lost opportunity. I mean, not only is it filled with phony data, misleading images, it also conveys the message that science is masculine. Throughout the video and in website materials, conventional girl culture, princesses, dollhouses, makeup, pretty clothes, it's shown as an obstacle to girls' science careers. Now, that's a terrible message, because girls can be girly as well as smart, ambitious, and formidable scientists. So my advice to parents, expose your daughter to a wide range of activities and career paths and allow her to pursue fields that truly interest her and let her know that she can be both pretty and pretty brilliant. Well, what do you think of the Verizon ad? I mean, should we be worried that more than 3 million people have watched it or that journalists fail to notice that it was manipulative propaganda? Well, please leave comments below. Now, this is the last video for this season, but we will begin again in September. And if you subscribe to the series and follow me on Twitter, we'll alert you when the next video is posted. And remember, 
Check your facts, not your privilege. Welcome to another mailbag episode of The Factual Feminist. I'm going to continue to respond to your perspicacious comments and questions. Commenter Nonia Rotman asks, Can you point to any industry that systematically discriminates against women? Is there any proof of this discrimination? What I see in America are companies bending over backwards to accommodate women. There is no evidence that I can see of systematic discrimination against women. As I explained in my first video, the famous 23-cent gender pay gap is simply the difference between the average earnings of all men and women working full-time. And it doesn't take into account differences in occupation, positions, education, job tenure, hours worked per week. And when competent economists look at all these variables and consider them, the wage gap narrows to the point of vanishing. Now, am I saying there's no discrimination? There may be some, and there are some studies that are worth paying attention to. For example, there was a gender bias study recently carried out by some Yale researchers. They sent faculty at several leading universities a fictitious resume from a graduate student asking for a job, and they asked them to evaluate it. Now, the very same resume was rated more highly when a man's name was attached. What's more, the science faculty, and this included male and female faculty, they were more likely to want to mentor the person if his name was John rather than named Jennifer. And they offered a slightly higher salary to John. Now, is this proof of discrimination in the workplace? Maybe, but... It's complicated because what people do in imaginary cases doesn't necessarily reflect what they do in real life. In 2009, the National Academy of Sciences did a study entitled Gender Differences at Critical Transitions in the Careers of Science, Engineering, and Mathematics Faculty. And it looked at what people actually do in academic science, not what they say they would do, what they really do. Well, what did they find? When it comes to getting hired, promoted, and tenured in math, science, and engineering, Women fare as well or better than men. Issues like gender equity in the workplace are complicated. They don't lend themselves to slogans, quick fixes, or sensational headlines. I agree with the questioner, Nonya Rotman, that there's no evidence of systematic discrimination. At the same time, I think there are probably workplaces where there is sexism, other workplaces where women enjoy favoritism. Okay, the next couple of comments will only make sense to you if you have watched my video on the new feminist biology program at the University of Wisconsin. A commenter says, quote, Now my eyes are open. We need feminist electrical theory to avoid the bias of male and female plugs in the electronics industry. (laughs) Well, that's a shocking idea. And don't tell it to the University of Wisconsin. They might take you up on it. A commenter named Ogramek asks, If the egg is actively resisting the sperm... Does that mean that procreative sex is rape on the cellular level? (laughs) Well, no, the egg does not resist the sperm. In fact, it actively encourages it. It's more like mutual attraction or even love at the cellular level. Now, several critical commenters urged readers not to take me seriously because I work at the Conservative American Enterprise Institute. Well, first of all, not everyone at AEI is conservative, And many, including myself, are political moderates and independents. So I urge everyone to visit the AEI website and look around and judge for themselves. But here's the thing. If you don't trust my scholarship because of where I work, that is not a reason to dismiss it. That's a reason to carefully review it. Now, when I see a piece of research that comes from a feminist center, I suspect that it may be biased, but I'm always careful to read it, evaluate it, check on the facts. And sometimes, not often, but sometimes I'm pleasantly surprised and I learn something. So I think the same should go for my critics. It's fine to approach what I say with skepticism, but you should also be open to the possibility of being pleasantly surprised and learning something. Well, that's the mailbag for this week. Please keep your questions coming. Subscribe to the channel for a new video every Monday. And thank you for following The Factual Feminist. Everywhere we hear about massive gender bias against women in fields like physics, technology, engineering. Well, what if it's just not true? That's coming up next on The Factual Feminist. There's a class at Harvard University called Math 55, which is advertised in the catalog as probably the most difficult undergraduate math course in the country. 
Math 55 does not look like America. Each year, as many as 50 students sign up, but at least half drop out within a few weeks. In 2006, the final roster was 45% Jewish, 18% Asian, 100% male. Well, some annoyed reader of the Harvard Crimson added, and all virgins. Well, as a rule, women tend to gravitate to fields such as education, English, psychology, biology, art history, while men are more numerous in physics, mathematics, computer science, and engineering. Why should that be? Well, there's no simple answer. But when professors were asked why there was a relative scarcity of female professors in math, science, and engineering, 1% believed that it was because of women's lack of talent. 24% believed that it was because of sexist discrimination and 74% chalked it up to differences between men's and women's interests. Well, let's delve into each of these explanations. 1% said scarcity of talent. I'm surprised anyone agreed with that, even to a pollster. These days, it's politically radioactive to deny that everyone is good at everything and no one is better than anyone else. (laughs) Well, consider this inconvenient finding. According to an analysis performed by my colleague, Mark Perry, for every 100 girls who score 700 points, or higher on the math section of the SAT, 184 boys do the same. The SAT performance gap suggests that there may be more boys at the highest level, but I still would say it does not adequately explain the dearth of women in Math 55 or University Physics and Engineering, because there there are many gifted females who could succeed in math and computer science, even if the pool is somewhat smaller. So let's move to the second possibility, sexist discrimination. I mean, this is hugely popular in the the women's lobby. Over the past decade or so, there has been an avalanche of literature claiming that women face hostile environments in math, tech, and engineering programs. Well, here's the first problem with all this. Why is there so much alleged discrimination in math and engineering, but not in biology, agriculture, veterinary medicine, law, where women are flourishing? There are indeed many studies that purport to show bias against women. But when anyone outside the STEM equity universe reviews them, they turn out to be flawed or sometimes shamelessly slanted. So let's turn to a third possibility, different interests. There's a lot of evidence that men and women, taken as groups, have somewhat different propensities, aspirations. Women earn more PhDs than men in the humanities, social sciences, education, life sciences. But men prevail by large numbers in engineering, physics, computer science. Does sexual stereotyping or patriarchy explain these choices? Or could it just be that in the pursuit of happiness, men and women take slightly different paths? When asked on a vocational preference test, how would you prefer to spend your time? More men than women say they would enjoy manipulating tools or taking part a machine. Women are more likely to say they'd prefer to work with people or living things. And finally, one last intriguing finding. Male and female math prodigies they differ in a significant way. Males are more likely to have what the experts call an asymmetrical cognitive profile. That means that their proficiency at math is not accompanied by a proficiency in verbal expression. On the other hand, females who are gifted in math are often just as gifted in verbal expression. And that gives them career prospects that the gifted men don't have. So my guess is that the girls with the talent for math 55 are just too interested in other pursuits to spend most of their week on linear algebra. Well, what do you think? And are there any explanations I may have missed? Please leave your answers and questions in the comment section. Follow me on Twitter and Facebook. And thank you for watching The Factual Feminist. This week is the 42nd anniversary of the famous equity law, Title IX. Stay tuned for the story of what happens when bad things happen to good laws. Coming up next on The Factual Feminist. Title IX was signed into law by President Richard Nixon on June 23, 1972. In 37 momentous words, it outlawed gender discrimination in all publicly supported educational programs. Now, before its passage, many of the nation's leading universities didn't accept women. Law schools, medical schools, they often used quotas to limit female enrollment. As for sports, female student-athletes were rare and received precious little support from college athletic programs. The logic behind Title IX is the same as that behind all great civil rights legislation. In our democracy, 
The government may not play favorites among races or religions or between the sexes. We're all equal before the law, including in public universities and, and colleges. Well, today, there are many formidable female athletes, and the progress of women's sports should be celebrated. But something went wrong in the law's implementation. Because of pressure from women's groups like the National Women's Law Center and the Women's Sports Foundation, Title IX evolved into a rigid quota regime that dictates equal participation in sports by both sexes, regardless of interest. Now, women's groups will deny that Title IX requires quotas, but it does. Schools are cutting back on male teams and creating new women's teams, not because of demand, but because they are afraid of a federal investigation. The goal in college athletics is called proportional representation. And what that means is that if a school has 60% females, then it should have 60% female athletes. I mean, look what happened at Howard University in Washington, D.C. Howard's student body is 67% female, but women are only 44% of its athletes. So in 2007, the Women's Sports Foundation, this powerful Title IX advocacy group, gave Howard the great F because of its 23% proportionality gap. Howard has already, at that time, had cut men's baseball, wrestling, and added women's bowling. But that just didn't narrow the gap. Unless it cuts about half of its current male athletes, it's going to remain under a Title IX cloud and legally vulnerable. Now, Howard's wrestling coach, Wade Hughes, summed up the problem this way. Quote, The impact of Title IX's proportionality standard has been disastrous because far more males than females are seeking to take part in athletics. No, say the Title IX advocates. Women are every bit as committed to sports as men. And they have persuaded courts that if there are fewer women than men on college varsity teams, the only explanation is discrimination. The factual feminist is concerned because the evidence that women taken as a group are less interested in competitive sports than men is overwhelming. I mean, to give just one example. In 2012, a group of psychologists carefully analyzed men and women's propensity for competitive sports by studying, for example, who plays intramural sports. These are recreational games that college students can play just for the love of the game. They're finding only one in four, about 26% of intramural participants are women. They also studied recreational activity in 41 public parks in four different states. Now, lots of women were exercising, but among those playing competitive team sports, only 10% were women. I am aware of no serious research that finds similar levels of interest between men and women in competitive sports. I mean, let's be honest. There is a fallacy in the proportionality requirement. Title IX was meant to be an equal opportunity law, not a rigid quota system. It was meant to open doors for aspiring female athletes. But because of the relentless pressure from activist groups, it ended up slamming doors to keep men out and athletic directors have to move heaven and earth to get enough women on their teams. Meanwhile, Title IX quotas have all but decimated men's wrestling, swimming, gymnastics, diving. Now, these sports and others are going extinct across the college campus for men. As one wrestling official put it, our sport survived the fall of Rome only to be conquered by Title IX. I'm going to end by asking a direct question to the Women's Sports Foundation. Your group gave Howard University an F because of it, its sports profile doesn't match its enrollments. They're 33% men, 67% women at Howard, yet women are only 44% of its teams. Well, nationally, women earn 58% of bachelor's degrees. Why doesn't the diminishing number of men on the college campus create a Title IX concern? The Factual Feminist gives the Women's Sports Foundation an F for basic fairness and, and common sense. Well, let me know what you think of the current state of Title IX. I'm especially interested in suggestions on how to restore it to its original democratic goals. And if you found this video worthwhile, please subscribe to the series and follow me on Twitter. And remember, check your facts, not your privilege. Some have described YouTube's comments as a disaster on an unprecedented scale. Well, the factual feminist viewers are very much the exception. I mean, your comments and questions are great, maybe the best on the Internet. And I'll respond to some of them coming up. Now, a commenter named Rendar Smith writes in response to the rule of thumb video, Christina, I love what you do, but you have got to drop the feminist label. The movement has failed. 
It's filling society with anti-male bigotry. Well, this is probably one of the most common criticisms that I, that I get. <laughs> Why call myself a feminist? Well, I became a feminist in high school back in the last millennium. I grew up uh, with a style of feminism that has nothing to do with what passes for feminism today. It wasn't about denigrating men or fixating on victimhood. It was about being a free, responsible, self-determining being. And in my writings, I call that style of feminism equity feminism, or more recently, freedom feminism. Freedom feminism stands for the moral, social, and legal equality of the sexes. And it's a great American success story. I still believe the world needs a healthy, evidence-based women's movement. And I think the major battles for equality and of opportunity in the United States, they have been fought, they have been won. But the work of feminism remains unfinished. Across the globe, there are women's groups struggling to survive in the face of genuine, sometimes violent oppression. And despite women's immense progress in the U.S., the poverty roles are still disproportionately filled with women and children. So I think the unique circumstances of women require special attention and sometimes protection. Now, having said all that, I am well aware that in the minds of many, feminism connotes an irrational, male-blaming, paranoid worldview. And I admit that I'm mortified by all the fuss about trigger warnings and microaggressions and checking your privilege. I mean, the spectacle of those panicked Wellesley women demanding that a statue of a guy be removed from campus because it reinforced the rape culture. That a controversial statue of that man walking, sleepwalking, I should say, in his underwear is triggering apprehension, fear, and even thoughts of sexual assault. I mean, to my mind, that is not feminism. That's just madness. Well, but I'm also aware that men in the United States, as much as women, face problems. I think it's hard to say who's better off. It's a complicated mix of burdens and benefits. So to answer the question, I fully understand that many may wonder why I don't clearly distance myself from the extremists who have run off with feminism. Why not commit myself to a more inclusive cause? Call it peopleism or equalism. Well, I'm tempted. But you know... I'm just not ready to give it up. I think the movement, it has a noble history, and it, can, it has to be reformed from within. And one last thing. If it bothers you that I call myself a feminist, just remember this. It bothers the gender warriors at Jezebel even more. On to the next comment. This one comes from Alice Ward. And Alice Ward points out that uh, the rape culture activists insists that it is wrong to be disrespectful and, and to assume that women lie about rape. But then she says, the thing that has always confused me is that according to these feminists, men are evil enough to rape, murder, commit all kinds of heinous acts, yet women aren't evil enough simply to lie. <laughs> well, I think that's a shrewd observation, Alice. I would call that the women are from Venus, men are from hell school of feminism. Well, please keep sending me your comments and questions. I greatly appreciate them and enjoy them. And if you've enjoyed this video and others, please subscribe to the series, follow me on Twitter, and thank you for watching The Factual Feminist. When news of the Santa Barbara killings broke, gender activists seized on it as a teachable moment about the war on women. There were more than a million tweets at the hashtag YesAllWomen. Well, what did we learn? Coming up next on The Factual Feminist. Now, many of the activists at the hashtag YesAllWomen insisted that no one was out to demonize men. And I'm sure that was true of many of the contributors. But consider this infographic that went viral once it was posted on Upworthy's Tumblr. You say not all men are monsters? Well, imagine a bowl of M&Ms. Ten percent of them are poisoned. Go ahead, eat a handful. After all, not all M&Ms are poison. Well, where to begin? First of all, what does that 10% figure represent? I mean, are they saying 10% of men are murderers or rapists? And, and what's the evidence for that? Are they talking about all men, American men, college men? Or as one blogger asked, men who play ukuleles or, or Martian men? And by the way, I wouldn't eat a single M&M if I knew that 10% or 1% or 0.01% of them were poisoned. But what's most wrong about this graphic is that it deploys the, the classic logic of bigots. 
I mean, think of saying, well, X percent of African Americans or Muslims or Jews or Hispanics, X percent of them are dangerous, and we just don't know which ones. So therefore, let's treat them all as suspects. Well, congratulations, Upworthy. You've promoted the same logical fallacy behind Jim Crow laws or racial profiling. Basically, the message to women is to treat all men as if they're poison. Now, I think men will be forgiven for finding the whole thing quite insulting. What's most upsetting to me as the factual feminist is that the shooting was an occasion for just an avalanche of misinformation about women and violence. Sarah Cliff at Vox rushed into print eight facts about violence against women everyone should know. Well, let's consider some of those facts. Number one, most women experience physical abuse in their lifetime. The most recent national survey of American women found that a slight majority, 51.9%, reported experienced physical violence at some point in their lives. Well, this sounds like American women are living in a state of siege. Vox does give the source, but my guess is that the author assumed no one checked it out. I'm not sure she looked at it herself, because here is what it says. And stay with me, this is a mouthful. 51.9% of surveyed women and 66.4% of surveyed men said that they were physically assaulted as a child by an adult caretaker and or as an adult by any type of attacker. An estimated 1.9 million women and 3.2 million men are physically assaulted annually in the United States. Now, Vox failed to inform readers that the study uh, counted as physical assault, grabbing, pushing, and shoving. Also, according to Vox, 1 in 10 women sustained a head or spinal injury as a result of physical assault. But if you read the study, you find that what it actually shows is that among all adult victims of physical assault who sustained an injury, both male and female, one in ten sustained head and spinal cord injuries. But Fox made it sound like every woman has a 10% chance of sustaining a head or spinal injury from a physical assault. Now, the truth is bad enough. Why hype it up with a misleading headline? Now, I've been studying research on violence against women for years, and I am sorry to report that much of it is untrustworthy. Now, critics sometimes accuse me of trivializing the problem of violence against women by questioning the research. In fact, I question the research because the problem of violence against women, against children, against men in the United States is just too serious to be left to advocates and careless journalists. Truth is on the side of compassion. Falsehood is no friend. I want to thank the viewers of this series for your many insightful remarks and conversations in the comments section. And please keep up the good work. And if you have suggestions for further episodes, let me know. And if you found this video useful, please subscribe. Follow me on Twitter. Thank you for watching The Factual Feminist. For years, women's activists have warned against using the phrase rule of thumb because of its shameful origins in wife abuse. Well, here is the story according to the leading law school textbook on domestic violence law. Quote, the rule of thumb of English common law permitted a man to beat his wife with a rod or switch as long as its circumference was no greater than the girth of the base of the man's right thumb. These laws established a tradition which was perpetuated in English common law and in most of Europe. Well, the phrase did not originate in any law about wife abuse, nor has anyone ever been able to locate any such law. It is now regarded largely regarded as a myth, even by most feminist professors. I mean, just Google the term rule of thumb, urban legend, and start reading. Now, anybody who takes the trouble to look at the, the Oxford English Dictionary would realize that the phrase rule of thumb did not originate in wife abuse. It seems to be that it came into use sometime in the 17th century. According to one folklorist, the real explanation derives from woodworkers who knew their trade so well that they didn't have to use rulers. Instead, they could measure things, for example, by the length of their thumbs. Well, even if the phrase rule of thumb is entirely innocent, what about that law that a man could beat his wife with a switch no thicker than his thumb? Did such a law ever exist? Was it deeply embedded in the English common law tradition in American law? No, yeah. no. Yeah. The answer is no. <laughs> the myth about this phantom law has been around for a long time. There was the occasional 19th century British and American jurist who mentioned the phantom law, but it has never been found. And believe me, people have tried. What they came up with is an 18th century judge named Francis Buller, and allegedly he deployed some version of this husband-and-stick law in his courtroom. 
Well, he never did refer to the law in any official ruling. He mentioned it in an off-record remark. He was then mercilessly pilloried in the London press and caricatured in cartoons as Judge Thumb. The legal legend was born, and in the hands of contemporary feminist researchers, a possible but never proved offhand remark by an 18th century judge becomes a foundational principle in the study of law. Reality check. The so-called rule of thumb does not occur anywhere in English common law, yet the myth of the rule of thumb lives on. It has been repeated by journalists, scholars, even politicians. In 2012, the State Department warned against the ruling because he said the phrase rule of thumb, it, it has these historical origins that could be offensive to some people. You would be a woman hater because it refers to an antiquated law. That now, some might think that the mistake over the rule of thumb in feminist textbooks is an isolated mistake. It's not. The problem with a lot of research on women is not so much that the authors make mistakes. We all make mistakes. The problem is that the mistakes are impervious to criticism. Now, I had an exchange with the author of Domestic Violence Law, Nancy Lemon, at Berkeley. I wrote to her before the third edition went into print and pointed out several errors, including the rule of thumb myth. Well, she was not pleased with my note. She dismissed my corrections, and the book went into its third printing with all the mistakes still there. Too many women's studies researchers are passionately committed to the view that American women are oppressed and under siege. At the same time, any critic who attempts to correct the false assumptions is dismissed as an anti-feminist crank. Well, as a philosophy professor of 20 years and as someone who respects truth and reason, the factual feminist finds it altogether unacceptable for students to be using textbooks with myths posing as scholarship. So I'm going to continue to follow the work of academic feminists, to criticize it when it's wrong, to learn from it when it's right. <laughs> if you've learned anything from this video, please like it. And if you've heard any other feminist myth that uh, has given you pause, let me know. Let me know in the comments section, and I will investigate. Then please subscribe to the series, follow me on Twitter, and thank you for watching The Factual Feminist. Sexual assault on campus is a genuine problem, but the new rape culture crusade is not the answer. That's coming up next on The Factual Feminist. Now watch these protesters shout down a speaker. It's a shame that you're using tactics to silence We will not be silenced. The speaker, a left-leaning anarchist concerned about police overreach, had once defended the idea of due process for those accused of sexual assault. Well, the rape culture activists were having none of it. They may think of their movement as progressive and world-improving. In reality, it's just the opposite. Professors at Oberlin, Rutgers, UCSB, they've been urged to place trigger warnings on class syllabi because they have books like The Great Gatsby or Things Fall Apart, which contain misogynist violence. Students at Boston University have demanded that a Robin Thicke concert be canceled. His hit song, Blurred Lines, is supposedly a rape anthem. Meanwhile, the list of schools being sued for their horrific mistreatment of falsely accused young men is growing. Presumed guilty is the new legal principle where sex is concerned. This movement will not help victims, but it will turn our campuses into hostile environments for free speech and for due process. It's already happening. And so far, university officials, political leaders, the White House, they're siding with the mob. What is going on? It appears that we're in the throes of one of those panics where paranoia, censorship, false accusations flourish and otherwise sensible people abandon their critical faculties. Now, we're not facing anything as extreme as the Salem witch trials or the McCarthy inquisitions. But today, the campus rape culture movement bears striking similarities to a panic over daycare centers in the 1980s. In what may become one of the biggest child molesting cases ever on record, seven nursery school teachers were arraigned today on more than 100 counts of child molestation. The accused in August of 1983, this anguished mother called the police and reported that her two-year-old son had been horrifically abused in the McMartin Preschool in Manhattan Beach, California. She described a network of underground tunnels where the school staff had sodomized her child and, and forced him to watch animal sacrifices. Well, the mother was mentally disturbed. Her story had no basis in reality. But the news media seized upon it 
and paranoia about satanic cults became a national epidemic. Parents were on edge, too, because advocacy groups had been telling them that as many as 50,000 children had been abducted by strangers. Well, as news of the McMartin barbarity spread, a national network of abuse therapists promptly materialized. And they used these intimidating interview techniques to implant false memories of abuse in children. Now, these abuse therapists were joined by an influential group of conspiracy-minded feminists, including Gloria Steinem and Catherine McKinnon. Now, there were some fantastic civil libertarian feminists who tried to blow the whistle on this witch hunt, but they were vilified by the conspiracy caucus as backlashers or child abuse apologists. Today's college rape panic is an eerie recapitulation of the daycare abuse scare. And once again, the hysteria is incited by the constant repetition of a fictitious statistic. In this case, the claim that one in five women on campus is a victim of rape. One in five women are victims of assaults while at college. Once again, conspiracy feminists are at the forefront of this movement. And just as feminist psychologists persuaded children that they had been abused, so feminist activists have persuaded many young women that a foolish, drunken hookup was actually a felony rape. Now, some people say that these moral panics, while overblown, they do call attention to a serious problem. This is deeply mistaken. The hysteria about daycare abuse and campus rape, it confuses and discredits genuine cases of abuse and violence. Molestation and rape are horrific crimes that warrant serious attention and vigorous response. Panics breed chaos and mob justice. Please let me know if you have any ideas on what we can do to stem this rape culture panic. And I welcome comments and suggestions. And if you find this video useful, please share it and subscribe to the series. And follow me on Twitter. Thank you for watching The Factual Feminist. Can America safely ignore the educational needs of boys just because they're protected by the patriarchy? Well, MSNBC seems to think so. It seems that men are doing just fine. Well, our next guest has a response for that, too. Coming up, we'll explain why the underachievement of American boys is a ticking time bomb. When I appeared on the MSNBC show, The Cycle, to discuss the plight of boys in school, the hosts were having none of it. All right, I see some of what you're saying, but I don't think the patriarchy, sadly, is actually under threat. The MSNBC skeptics are hardly alone in dismissing the plight of boys and young men. Just recently, Vox, this new website started by the former New York Times statistics guru Ezra Klein, it told its readers, well, boys have always done worse than girls in school. There's nothing new to worry about here. Well, it failed to explain why it is that male deficits in education are far more serious today than they were in the past. I mean, as recently as 30 years ago, a mediocre male student could get his high school diploma, find a job, work hard, make it into the middle class. Those days are gone forever. Education beyond high school is the new ticket to the American dream. Today, women earn 62% of associate's degrees, 57% of BAs, 60% of master's, and 52% of doctorates. Well, what's in store for a minimally educated young man? The wages of men with only a high school diploma have declined 47% since 1969. Now, the British, the Canadians, the Australians, they're struggling with a boy gap, and they are trying desperately to address it because they view the widespread underachievement of males as a threat to their national economy. Why is this happening to boys? What explains the college gap? Well, one of the best sources for insight about students is the University of Michigan Monitoring the Future Survey. Since 1975, the Michigan researchers have been studying large national samples of students. Now, they found that in the 1970s and 80s, nearly the same number of top male and female students had very high aspirations. They planned to be pursuing postgraduate degrees in fields like law, medicine, science, college teaching. It was about 14% of boys and girls. Well, by the 2000s, 27% of girls expressed that ambition, compared to only 16% of boys. Now, why isn't there a national effort to address this ambition gap? Congress passed legislation characterizing girls as an underserved population. There were hundreds of millions of dollars made available to improve girls' self-esteem, their, their math and science achievement. Well, where are the efforts for boys? 
Now, Arne Duncan, the U.S. Secretary of Education, has yet to comment on male underachievement. But he's not idle on the gender gap front. He made a cameo appearance along with Beyonce in Sheryl Sandberg's Girl Power Ban Bossy video, where he encouraged girls to be ambitious. We need to tell them it's okay to be ambitious. The factual feminist is disappointed. MSNBC and the women's groups, they're known to be polemical. But the well-being of boys is too important for television antics and gender war hijinks. As for Secretary Duncan, his apparent indifference to the boy gap is alarming. His department is the federal agency responsible for the educational well-being of the nation's children, girls and boys. Well, what do we need to do to get American boys interested in education? Please leave your thoughts in the comments. Subscribe to the video. Follow me on Twitter. Thank you for watching The Factual Feminist. Have you heard of women's math known as galgebra or women's chemistry called femistry? Well, those are faux courses from episodes of The Simpsons, but a new feminist biology program at the University of Wisconsin is all too real. Now, let's see. Should I major in femistry or galgebra? Is feminist biology likely to contribute to our knowledge and understanding of the world? The factual feminist is skeptical. First of all, the fellowship will be monitored by the University of Wisconsin's Women's Studies Department, not the Biology Department. Now, when asked about why they needed feminist biology, a postdoctoral fellow who's been chosen for the program, she explained to Campus Reform that, quote, in order to do science well, she said, we can't ignore the ideas and research of people who just don't happen to be male. But wait a minute, women are hardly ignored in biology. In fact, they have far surpassed men in earning biology degrees. What is more, women are flourishing and winning Nobel Prizes in that field. So what does biology look like through the feminist prism? Well, here are a few examples. There was a feminist astronomer who argued that the phrase Big Bang Theory was off-putting to potential female astronomy students. And then, of course, there was the formidable Catherine McKinnon, she argued that the male scientific approach was similar to that of a rapist who would take joy in violating Mother Nature, penetrating her secrets. Now let's take a quick look at what some would consider to be a, a serious and solid achievement of feminist theory in the area of biology. And that would be the debunking of the active sperm passive egg myth. According to feminist lore, Male biologists described fertilization in terms of the macho warrior sperm invading the koi and passive egg. It took alert and clear-eyed feminist biologists to overthrow this backward sexist view. <laughs> well, was it really feminist biologists who discovered the active egg? No, that narrative is a complete myth. Scientists have known about the active egg since the 19th century. But magazines like Popular Science are still printing the feminist lore of the active egg, even though it has been definitively refuted. Now, the feminist myth about the sperm and egg is typical of feminist theory in general. It's been built on a foundation of paranoia about the patriarchy, half-truths, untruths, oversimplifications, and it's immune to correction. Critics are dismissed as heretics or backlashers. Now, make no mistake, this new program is not really about getting more women into the field. It's about promoting women with the right world view. Memo to the University of Wisconsin. We don't need feminist biology any more than we need femistry or galgebra. We need good biologists, not agenda-driven, politicized science. Well, tell me what you think of feminist biology. Do we need to apply a feminist lens to the sciences? Let me know in the comments, and please subscribe to future episodes. Follow me on Twitter, and thank you for watching The Factual Feminist. The breathless repetition of exaggerated numbers by the president and by journalists is getting in the way of genuine solutions to the scourge of sexual violence. We've made incredible progress since 1994, but we cannot let up. Not when one in five women will be a victim of rape in their lifetime. Coming up next, we check the facts behind the one in five estimate. The one in five rape figure comes from the National Intimate Partner and in Sexual Violence Survey, released in 2011 by the Centers for Disease Control. Now, newspapers everywhere carried the alarming news. The CDC survey reported 
that in the United States in 2010, approximately 1.3 million women were raped and an additional 12.7 million women and men were victims of sexual violence. Now, former Health and Human Services Secretary Catherine Sebelius hailed the report for giving what she called a clear picture of sexual violence in the United States. But was it a clear picture? First of all, the agency's figures are wildly at odds with the official crime statistics. The Justice Department's annual crime survey, which is the gold standard in crime research, it reports that there were about 188,000 rapes and sexual assaults in 2010. Where did the CDC find more than a million and nearly 14 million victims of sexual violence that professional criminologists somehow overlooked? It found them by using a poorly constructed telephone survey with a low response rate and a non-representative sample of respondents. No one interviewed was asked if they had been raped or sexually assaulted. Instead of such straightforward questions, the CDC determined whether the responses indicated sexual violation. Now, 61.5% of the women the CDC projected as rape victims in 2010 experienced what the CDC called, quote, alcohol and drug facilitated penetration. Now, what does that mean? I mean, if a woman was unconscious or incapacitated, then every civilized person would call it rape. But what about sex while inebriated? I mean, few people would say that intoxicated sex alone constitutes rape. Indeed, a non-trivial percentage of all customary sexual intimacy, including marital sex, probably falls under that definition. In short, by using a non-representative sample and vaguely worded questions, the CDC yielded the 1 in 5 lifetime rate and the 1.3 million female rape victims per year. Now, how did the CDC come up with nearly 13 million female and male victims of sexual violence other than rape in 2010? Participants were asked if they had ever had sex because someone pressured them by telling you lies. Uh, did you ever have sex because someone made promises about the future they knew were untrue? Or did someone ever pressure you into sex by showing you they were unhappy? Any affirmative answer to these questions counted as sexual violence. Look, to prevent rape and sexual assault, we need state-of-the-art research. We need sober estimates. False and sensational statistics are going to get in the way of effective policies. And unfortunately, when it comes to research on sexual violence, exaggeration and sensation are not the exception. They are the rule. Now, if you hear about a study that shows epidemic levels of sexual violence against American women or college students or women in the military, I can almost guarantee the researchers use some version of the defective CDC methodology. Now, by this method, known as advocacy research, you can easily manufacture a women's crisis. But here's the bottom line. This is madness. First of all, it trivializes the horrific pain and suffering of survivors, and it sends scarce resources in the wrong direction. Sexual violence is too serious a matter for antics, for politically motivated posturing. <laughs> and right now, the media, politicians, rape culture activists, they are deeply invested in these exaggerated numbers. It's hard to see how this trend is going to be corrected, and I welcome your suggestions for solutions. So please leave comments below the video, and if you find this video series helpful, I invite you to subscribe and follow me on Twitter. Now remember, if you hear any claims about women that strike you as reckless exaggerations, send them my way. Thank you for watching The Factual Feminist. Would girls and young women be helped if we banned the word bossy? By middle school. Girls are less interested in leadership than boys. And that's because they worry about being called bossy. We'll lean into the data behind Sheryl Sandberg's claims coming up next. Is society preventing girls and young women from becoming leaders? Will Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg think so? and she's recruited major celebrities to help promote her Ban Bossy campaign. When I was growing up, I was called bossy. I think the word bossy is just a squasher. Being labeled something matters. Now, Ban Bossy has faced a lot of criticism for policing language, for patronizing girls and women, and for just being annoying. But here's what distresses the factual feminist. 
the campaign has been built on a foundation of spurious research and cherry-picked findings. There are two journalists, Ash Scow at the Washington Examiner and Kathy Young at Newsday, who did something almost unheard of when it comes to women's statistics. They checked the facts. So let's take a close look at some of what they uncovered. We know that by sixth or seventh grade, parents have higher aspirations for their sons than their daughters. Now, versions of this claim are found throughout the Ban Bossy website. The claim is footnoted to a legitimate study, the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health. But if you go to the study, what you find is, yes, slightly more parents expect high leadership from their seventh grade sons. But in the eighth and ninth grade, the numbers reverse and show more concern for the leadership skills of their daughters. Now, the lead author of the study, Kathleen Mullen of the University of North Carolina, told both the examiner reporter and me that the most robust finding of the study was that there was so little difference that parents value leadership in their daughters as much as they do in their sons. In short, Ban Bossy cherry-picked the seventh grade findings and made it seem as though the study found that pa parents favor boys. Consider another example, an alarming finding of the Ban Bossy researchers. The source for this is a 1991 study from the American Association of University Women, Shortchanging Girls, Shortchanging America. Now that 23-year-old self-esteem study has been widely discredited. In my book, Who Stole Feminism? I took a very careful look at the study and explained why it was unreliable. And the late Susan Nolan Hoxma, a prominent psychologist and Yale University professor, dismissed this AAUW study as, in her words, much ado about nothing and she noted that it had been refuted by countless studies that used larger samples and had much ba better measures of self-esteem. Now, in Sheryl Sandberg's Ban Bossy Initiative, this discredited study is presented as unvarnished truth. But here's what's most worrying about the Ban Bossy campaign, is that it comes out at a time when boys have fallen seriously behind girls. They are so far behind academically, it's not a gap, it's a chasm. This chart shows that women earn more degrees than men at every level. Put another way, there are about 140 women who will graduate with a college degree or advanced degree this year for every 100 men. Look, boys and girls both face unique challenges in school and in life, and they will both be well served by truth and careful research, not hype, spin, and advocacy data. Sheryl Sandberg and her colleagues should rethink the Ban Bossy campaign. Now, if you hear a claim or a statistic about women that strains credulity, let us know in the comments section and we'll check it out. And uh, not to be bossy, but I urge you, leave comments or better yet, subscribe to the video series. Thank you for watching The Factual Feminist. White House spokesman Jay Carney tied himself in knots this week trying to explain this inconvenient fact. The median salaries in the White House, uh, women make 88% of what men make. And I'll tell you what he said coming up. This week we heard over and over again from the White House, from members of Congress, from journalists, that women earn 23 cents less than men for doing the same work. On average, a woman still earns just 77 cents for every dollar a man does. And today, Congress argued over a bill called the Paycheck Fairness Act. And that bill is premised on this 23-cent wage gap injustice. Well, let's do a little reality check. First of all, no competent labor economist takes the 23-cent wage gap injustice claim seriously. There was an analysis of more than 50 peer-reviewed papers commissioned by the Department of Labor. What they found is that the so-called wage gap is mostly, perhaps entirely, an artifact of the different choices men and women make, different fields of study, different professions, different balances between home and work. Now, wage gap activists will argue that even when you control for relevant variables, women still earn less. Well, it always turns out they omit one or two crucial variables. So why play this game? Now, a colleague of mine, the economist Mark Perry, has been blogging for several months about the gender pay gap at the White House. 
it turns out that the medium pay for female staffers is 88% of that of male staffers. Now, White House spokesman Jay Carney created a firestorm of protest among reporters because he was tap dancing around this embarrassing fact. Well, I would, I would say a couple of things about this. We know that closing the gender wage gap is a key part of our uh, uh, economic uh, agenda, women's agenda, and here at the White House, uh, equal uh, pay legislation deems that there should be equal pay for equal work, and that's what we have. He insisted on the one hand, oh no, women earn equal pay for equal work in the Obama administration. Um, and he sort of dismissed the 88 cent figure as being, well, just an aggregate of everyone on the staff from junior to senior levels. Well, what he essentially was saying is that the 88 cent gap is no proof of White House discrimination, since it leaves out so many variables. Well, fine, that's right. But why then does the president use the 77 cent figure, which is misleading in exactly the same way? Now, uh, reporters also pressed Betsy Stevenson, who's a member of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. They pressed her about the bogus factoid. Uh, to her credit, she quickly acknowledged that there were a lot of things that go into the 70 cent figure and uh, many things contribute to it and that no one was saying she said that it was about discrimination. Well, yes, they are. And activists, politicians, they have been saying it for years. Now, it is not my claim that women no longer face discrimination in the United States. There, there is no evidence that I can see, or most responsible economists can see, of systemic wage discrimination against women. But of course, there are still workplaces where women are being shortchanged. But here's the bottom line. Women who are struggling economically or, or coping with gender bias, they're going to be best served by truth, careful research, not hype, spin, factoids, advocacy data, will all be better served by truth. So the White House, members of Congress, journalists, and everyone else should stop using the specious wage gap statistic. Just let it go. I'm Christina Hoff Summers. Thank you for joining me. Now leave your questions in the comment section below this video, and we'll try to address them in a future episode. And if you hear a statistic on women that's strange credulity, post it in the comment sections so my team and I can check the facts. And also subscribe so you can get an alert about our next video. Thank you.